David Novak is an American businessman, author, and philanthropist. He is a founder and CEO of David Novak Leadership and a co-founder and former CEO of Yum Brands. So David Novak Leadership is a digital leadership development platform that he created to help people become better leaders by teaching vital heart wiring and hard wiring skills. Now, retired chairman and CEO of Yum Brands is one of the world's largest restaurant companies. They have 45,000 restaurants, parent company of Pizza Hut and uh, Taco Bell, KFC as well. In fact, there were one and a half million people employed at Yum Brands at the time he was CEO. Uh, 2012 CEO of the year by Chief Executive Magazine, 30 best CEOs by Barron's, top people in business by Fortune, and 100 best performing CEOs in the world by the Harvard Business Review. So my goodness, uh, that's quite a, an intro there, David. It's, we're so fortunate to have you here with us. And of course, with me also, Matt Doherty, my co-host on this leadership series. So welcome to both great. of you. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have da you. Da da David, it's been an honor, man, to have you on the show. I've uh, been a fan of yours uh, over the last few years as I've gotten into the leadership space. Uh, you're a model for, for me um, and somebody that I really try to learn from. Uh, as I studied your background a little bit, um, I always like to go back to the youth. Like, what was it like growing up? And you talk about a nomadic lifestyle and how that impacted your career. Can you can you share a little bit about that? Well, my father was a government surveyor, so he did the longitude and latitude mark for map making, and uh, he didn't know it back when he was doing it, but that, that helped serve the foundation for the GPS system. But he would survey in a small town with the surveying party. Uh, they, they'd do the surrounding area. And then we'd move every three months uh, to the next small town. Uh, I'm the only person you know that's lived in Dodge City, Kansas, maybe. But I've actually lived there twice. But we lived in small towns and we moved every three months. And my mother would check me into schools and say, David, you better make a friend because we're leaving. And, and, uh, you know, the interesting thing was, Matt and Jane, I, I, I think that I lived in 23 states by the time I was in seventh grade. And my mother, I remember once went to one of the teachers, Mrs. Ann Schultz, and she said, I'm so worried about moving David all around. And she said, oh, oh, Mrs. Novak, you shouldn't at all. He's getting the best education of anybody because he's being forced to move into new situations and adapt and understand people. And uh, I think that Mrs. Ann Schultz was absolutely 100 percent right. Uh, because one of the things that I think uh, helped me as I was moving up in uh, the ladder in business was the fact that I I was blessed with pretty good people skills. And, you know, I think it was the fact that I had to go in to new situations, survey the landscape, figure out who I wanted to get to know, who I could become friends with, and then uh, uh, go after it. And one thing I did learn is you're only one good friend away from happiness when you're a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So so it, you you go to the University of Missouri, is that correct? Right, right. And yeah. and, and why why uh Mizzou? Well, you know, I have a very untraditional background, Matt. You know, I um went to, I I was when I was unlike you when I was uh in high school, you know, I, I wanted to be a great athlete, but I just wasn't. I mean, you know, you had that uh, capability. Uh, so, you know, I played baseball and, you know, I was OK, but I wasn't like a, a great athlete. So I wanted to find something else that I could distinguish myself from. And, you know, I realized I was a pretty good writer. So I became editor of the newspaper, sports editor of the newspaper. And uh, so I went to the University of Missouri thinking that someday I, I might be uh, a journalist. And, uh, you know, I have to admit, my first couple of years, I, I, I partied more than I studied, but I did get into journalism school. And that's when I got back to my love. And I actually found out my love was advertising and marketing. So I majored in advertising and, uh, uh, and got my journalism degree and then, then began my career afterwards. Well, it's nice to know if you spend a couple of years partying, you can still become a success too. It's not all, you know, it's not all done if you're, you know, a couple of years wasted there. Mm -hmm. Who would you say, David, would be like the most impactful person as you rose up through your career? You know, I was very 
and bless uh, Jane because everybody I work with ultimately became a president of a company, a CEO of a company, or a fun functional leader. So I never had a bad boss. Always had great bosses. Uh, and they always took an interest in me. And they wanted to develop me. And, and I think, you know, that was just uh, an, an incredible benefit in my, my career because I always had people investing in, in, in me and trying to help me be the best I could, could be. But the, I think the person that was most influential uh, was later on in my career uh, when we co-founded Young Brands, Andy Pearson who was a former president of PepsiCo, uh, teacher at Harvard Business School, uh, worked at Clayton Dubler and Rice, which is an investment banking company or a private equity company. And, you know, uh, Andy and I teamed up together. And Andy was a voracious learner. And, you know, he, he really taught me the importance of being a big time learner. I had always done a lot of that when I was uh, coming up in, in, in business. But he was incredible, and he he knew how to stay young. Uh, you know, he was seventy years old when we started working together. When he passed away, he was eighty. I gave the eulogy at his funeral, and and you know, it's called Amazing Andy because this guy just was. He might have been eighty years old, but he was eighty years young. You know, when you talk to him about his talk to when he talked to his grandkids, he's talking about J Lo and A Rod, and you know, he'd send me articles and books that I could read. And he opened up all these doors that I I uh for people that I met that I would have never met because of him. And you know, people like uh Ken Langone at uh co-founder of Home Depot, John Weinberg, uh, you know, one of the top people at uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Jamie Dimon and I became, you know, great friends and he was on our board because of Andy and, uh, and I ultimately went on the JP Morgan chase board, but I, none of this would have happened without Andy being the guy, uh, believing in me. You know, sometimes I think you need in, in your life, someone who believes in you more than you even believe in yourself. And I always had a lot of confidence, but Andy gave me more confidence. And he started talking about me becoming a great CEO before I even really knew what a CEO did. And, you know, I'll, I'll always love Andy Pearson. It, it, isn't that so powerful that even though you're at top of the food chain, you still need encouragement. You still need encouragers in your life. Uh, that's why... Um, I enjoy doing what I do as an executive coach before that being a basketball coach. Um, one thing that I, I noted in, in looking at information is, and I talk about self-talk. There's a lot of negative self-talk. The most time we spend with anybody is ourselves and we could be our worst enemy. Tell us about the one word you added uh, to um your life that that helped you and and uh it's spelled y-e-t from oh. what i read you know <laughs> tell tell us about that because you were yeah. you were already at the top of your game yeah. but yet you still needed confidence you still needed to show up with this demeanor talk about that yeah. well a lot of times people say you know i haven't gotten this promotion and or I haven't uh, been able to uh, grow the business or, you know, I haven't been able to develop a new product or it, it could be a myriad of things. But if you just add the word yet at the end of that sentence, it kind of creates hope. It says, you know, yeah, OK, yeah, you haven't done it yet, but there's plenty more time in your life to do it. And I think that one of the things you have to have as a, a, a as a leader is you have to have the right mindset. You have to have the mindset that says that that you're capable of more than what you might even think you are. You know, I always say you never know what you're capable of. And so I, I think that yet says, hey, hey, maybe you haven't done it yet, but you can do it in the future. No, I, I love you that. And, and I love I love the fact that, you know, no matter how old you are, yet still can work. You know, yeah. you might start getting a little, you know, discouraged whenever you're in your 60s, 70s. You're like, I haven't done everything I thought I would do. But if you're still saying yet, there's still a possibility. That could you happen. know, uh, a great story about Andy Pearson, who I just mentioned. He was the uh, president of PepsiCo and he went to Harvard and he went to teach business school there. And, you know, uh, Harvard students at the end of the year gave him his review. They give you 360 degree feedback. Uh he was the worst professor in the school. 
Okay. And the reason was Andy came up from that school of thought of, of leadership is just, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm smarter than I'm smart. I, I'm the boss. Here's what you need to know. Okay. Well, you know, he went in there and told everybody how they ought to think. And he got the feedback and he totally flipped it around and then went back and, and got people to, you know, look at cases, do the Socratic method of teaching and had them figure it out for themselves. And the next year he had the highest rating in business school because he had the self-awareness it takes to, to get better at what you, you do. And he had to drive. I mean, he did not want to be the worst teacher at Harvard. And, you know, he wasn't the best teacher yet, but he became one. David, 17 years as the CEO of Yum Brands, um, millions of employees, uh, multiple continents and countries, you were in that position for 17 years. That's a long time in a stressful role. How did you manage that? Well, first of all, I never really looked at it as a stressful role. It might have been, but, you know, I loved what I did. I never felt like I was ever working. I never felt like I ever went to work. We had some tough times, but it was like, hey, life isn't always perfect. But I get to be a part of this. Even when things aren't going well, I get a chance to fix it. I get a chance to work with team members. So I, I kept that attitude. But Matt, I always try to get up every morning and I do my gratitude. So I write down three things that I'm grateful for. I do a devotional. I, I, I have my conversation with God every day and I write it down. And then I work out and you know I get physically fit. I try to stay physically fit. And those things get my energy level up and get my mind in the right framework to go to work. You know, I was taught this uh, concept years ago called the mood elevator. You know, you, you make your very best decisions when you're at the top of the mood elevator. And that's where you're grateful. And you have gratitude. You make your worst decisions when you're at the bottom when you're angry and resentful. So I try to, every day before I went to work, I try to work my way up that mood elevator so I could at least be curious and interested by the time I went to work, <laughs> you know, and hopefully move into that gratitude state. But I think you have to be aware of your moods and, 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 and try to get your mood in, in the right state so you can perform at your very best. You're big on culture. I love talking about culture. Um, it is kind of mystical, uh, sometimes hard to measure. Everybody nowadays wants immediate metrics. How did you drive your culture across 135 countries with a million and a half employees? <laughs> How did you do that? You know, man, I'm kind of like you. I don't really even like the word culture. It's oh. everybody talks about it, but to me, it's more like a germ, you know, you know, to me, what what really is a culture is, is the work environment you create, how you work together. So I never talked about our culture, per se. I talked about how we work together, you know, and, and then as a result of that, you know, culture became, I think, our biggest competitive advantage. The first thing that we did, is, and I would recommend this to everybody, is you have to identify the behaviors that you know will drive results. So what we did is we looked at our highest performing restaurant managers and, and we got our top 10% and studied them really hard. And we learned that they did a number of things that other people didn't do. You know, they had enormous customer focus. They had high positive energy. They were accountable. They, they recognized people for their worth. Uh, they had a belief in people and love developing people. But anyway, we, we, we identified eight how we work together, principles. And then what we did, and I think the thing that really took off is I was always a big believer in recognition, that you needed to let people know that you appreciated them and you valued them if they performed. When we saw people exhibit those behaviors, what we did as a team and as an organization is that we recognized the heck out of people who did those things. Now, what we did early on and is that we trained everybody, all of our leadership teams all around the world, around these how we work together principles. And we had exercises. 
like, you know, po positive energy. We taught teacher, people about the mood elevator that I talked to you about. Okay. We, for accountability, we had an exercise called the accountability ladder. Now you have to, you know, climb all the way to the top, which is accept whatever it is and get on with it versus making excuses. But we train people on these principles all around the world. And we created the shared experience, which I think is important. If you really want to drive something deep in your organization, you create a shared experience, you know, where, where people can really relate to it and, and, and they see it together. Like I used to go on bus tours to look at different restaurants with our, with our people because it was something we could all do together. And then we would say, okay, what do we learn? What do we see? And then we talk about it and, and uh, you know, come get a line in terms of how we could take that learning and, and, and go to the next level. You know, it's, it's, it's that shared experience, I think, that really drives performance, drives a culture. And we made our cultural training a shared experience where people will say, I remember when mm -hmm. yeah, we did this. And, and then, you know, the other thing I really believe is, is that, you know, uh, the worst thing that can happen in an organization and in any culture is when people say, I remember when we used to do this. I think as a leader, you got to create new memories every day that reinforce the culture you're trying to get get at. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but that's how we made it happen across the board. Now, obviously, every restaurant you go into, you might not feel that culture. And that was something we were always working on. And, you know, you, you're not perfect. But I have to tell you, when I went around to our restaurant support centers and all of our our, our headquarters around the world, um, you could feel our culture. You could feel it when you walked in the building. And the thing that really made it go was recognition. We just had a lot of fun recognizing people. And the recognition had to be earned. But yep. you know, if somebody did something good, you know, we recognized. And we didn't wait for the, the uh, monthly meeting or the annual review. We did it when we saw it. Spontaneous recognition is key. Yeah. Give, give, give us an example of that, uh, David. How could somebody in today's work environment recognize? Because as you touched on in some of your um, uh, articles, it's not natural for a lot of people to give recognition for various reasons. There are different barriers, I think you talk about, recognition barriers. Discuss right. that. Yeah, well, a lot of people, believe it or not, don't want to recognize people because they're afraid they do, if they do, they'll the people won't work as hard. A lot of people say, I don't want to recognize people because, hey, if I, you know, if I recognize Sally, Jim's going to be upset. You know, uh, a lot of people don't want to do recognition because they want to have a tough, uh, you know, exterior that, that that demands high performance. You know, these are things. They're all a bunch of bunk. You know, they're they're all just, you know, rationale that really doesn't stand up um, when when you think about it. Um, what I really believed in is the first thing, and I call it purposeful recognition. The first thing is you got to identify what you're going to recognize. Though in our case, it was our how we work together principles. Mm -hmm. Then I think you try to you should try to make recognition personal. You know, for me, when I was president of KFC, I gave away a rubber chicken, and then I would write on every rubber chicken what that person did to get it. I'd number it, okay, and I'd take a picture with people and say, your picture is going to go in my office because what you do is what's really important. And, you know, and you can, I'm going to send you a picture. You can throw it in the trash if you want, but your picture is going up on my wall because you're, you're, you're who really makes, makes it happen. Well, it was unbelievable. The response I got by giving away this rubber chicken. Then I, when I went to be president of pizza, I gave away these cheese heads. You know, the Green Bay Packer cheese heads, you would know that being up there in Notre Dame land for a yep. number of years. OK, and I'd write on them, number them, take the picture, do the same thing. Then when I became chairman of uh, of, of Young Brands, CEO of Young Brands, I gave away these walk the talk to you. OK, and I'd write on the top of them, number them, give away, uh, take the picture. And and and, you know, if you went into my office in Louisville, Kentucky, you would see my office is lined from floor to ceiling with people I recognized all around the world. And people said, what happens if you run out of wall space? I said, well, we'll put them on the ceiling. And we did. We put them up on the ceiling, okay? Because people want to know what you're all about as a leader, and they always want to see the CEO's office. So when they came to my office, they'd see that it was all about people. But I had a lot of fun recognizing people. And 
So I think in organizations, the shadow of the leader is what matters. People will do what the leader does. People would see what I was doing and how it would motivate people. And they'd say, I'm going to do it too. Now, my team got very aligned on this, okay, because they knew it was important to me. And I asked them all to develop their own personal recognition awards and to start recognizing people. And they did. And guess what happened? Their teams did. And guess what happened? Their teams did. And we just cascaded that up and down the organization. Now, a lot of people say, hey, I'm not a floppy chicken kind of person. I agree. You might not be a floppy chicken kind of person. You might, Matt, you might be a basketball kind of person. You might want to give away a mini basketball and write on it and say, hey, you know, thanks for going the distance or, you know, making the, you know, achieving your goal or whatever it is. I don't mm -hmm. know, Jane, what you really are into. Okay. But whatever it is that you're into, then create your own personal award and then give it away in a personal fashion. Because I think people love it when you give away a piece of your heart. Wow. And people wow. said to me, you know, hey, you know, can you recognize people too often? Maybe you can. Maybe, maybe I recognize somebody who didn't deserve it. I always tried to make it well earned, but I would much rather err on that side than not do it at all. And all the Gallup polls say there are two reasons why people leave their jobs. Number one, they don't appreci feel appreciated for what they do. And number two, they don't get along with their boss. That's why I believe in developing coaches, you know, not bosses. And mm -hmm. that's those two things are part and parcel together. When you have a boss mindset, you don't you don't really appreciate your people the way you you, you really should. So there's all kinds of uh hard stuff that says this is the right thing to do and the soft stuff that says it's the right to, stuff to do. I, but I think recognition is the soft stuff that drives hard results. Yeah. Well, and you also have a, a podcast where you, you interview a lot of, of leaders. And tell us a little bit about the story where you interviewed the Pepsi CEO and Dira Nuri and what she did to encourage employees. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I have a podcast. It's It's be doing quite well and I love doing it. This morning, I just did a podcast with, uh, believe it or not, Brett Baer. Okay, he's a leader in podcasting. And then I, you know, I did, did one. I just posted a couple last, you know, I post them every Thursday, but I did one with uh, Alan Mulally from, from the former Ford CEO. And, you know, I did one with uh, 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 Corey Robertson, who actually is the business brains behind Duck Dynasty. You know, so I have a lot of fun doing the, the podcast. It, it keeps me young, keeps me learning, and I love it. And I did a podcast with Indra Nui. Um, and, you know, Indra is a person who also believes in recognition, and she would uh, write letters uh, to uh, the parents of the people that work for her. Uh, when they had done a really good job. And that means a lot to them. I, I used to do the same thing. Um, you know, I, I had uh, uh, Vijay Sukumar, who was the R&D head for in India. His father uh, was is a celebrated lawyer in India. So I sent him a Yum Award congratulating him on his son and how great his son was. And, and, Lynn, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, Indra did the same thing. And we both found it to be enormously powerful. So as as you go up the org chart, and I, ha I hate to say up the org chart, I like to invert the org chart and, and have the CEO at the bottom, see servant leadership. But to do that all, the soft skills takes time. So how do you free up your calendar so you're not so stacked that you can't write that handwritten note on a rubber chicken, take a picture and send it? H how do you manage your day? You, you make it a part of what you do. It, you're on the lookout for recognition. For example, I would be in a meeting and let's say I had somebody from IT make a presentation for on behalf of his team on what they thought was going to help us manage labor better in our restaurants. And I was impressed with it. I would get up from that meeting, go into my office, get a YUM award and give them a team award. Okay. Mm -hmm. And take a picture and everybody would clap and everybody would say, great job. And it didn't, it doesn't take any time. Just build it into your job, make it yeah. a part of what you do. And you know what? It, it it's, it's, it's the easiest thing, the most powerful thing you can do uh, in to, to really drive high performance because people, 
will do more of what the leader is looking for. That's right. I, w- I played for a legendary coach and leader like you, Dean Smith, and I coached at North Carolina, and, and I would meet with him, and, and one time he told me to praise the actions you want repeated. Yeah. And it was very simple, but that's what you do by recognizing purposely your employees. It's powerful. Absolutely. Simple, Absolutely. but powerful. Hey, you know, yeah. I, I visited John Wooden. I, I always did best practice visits, and we wanted to build the, the Yum Dynasty. And, you know, yeah. obviously John Wooden built a dynasty. So I went to Encinita, California, went to his condominium and sat down and, and, and talked to him about leadership. And, you know, he said, David, you know, I didn't expect, I didn't have a whole lot of rules. There were a few that I had. He said, one of them, was that anytime anybody on the team scored a basket, they needed to acknowledge the person that set the pick, made the assist, or helped them get it done. And he said, I had one player say to me one time, well, what if they're not looking? And I looked at him, I said, oh, they'll be looking. (laughs) And, And I think it's, you know, but here's this greatest coach ever, by many people's estimation, he understood the, the power of recognition. The great leaders, the the Dean Smiths, you know, the, you know, all the great leaders really understand that 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 power. And I I think it's the leader's secret weapon. Yeah, as we come to a close, um, I've I've deal with clients, friends who struggle with transition from retirement at a CEO type position, head coaching position, you've done it gracefully. You've done it and continue. You, you just said that you're, uh, you keeps me learning. You're a lifelong learner. How did you intentionally make the transition as this big time CEO at Young Brands to normal life? You know, it's very interesting because, you know, people ask me, because I love our companies. You could tell I'm passionate about our company and, and, you know, we had great success. And I always tell everybody, I didn't know I could love something so much and miss it so little. Wow. And why is that? You know, I, I believe that you have to understand what your joy builders are, you know, and, and your joy blockers, you know, start out just by writing down all the things that block your joy. Okay. And then write down all the things that give you joy. And you want to eliminate as many things you can that block your joy and spend time on the things that give you joy. Now, when I was at, at Young Brands, the thing that I loved more than anything was developing people and teaching leadership. I had a leadership program called Taking People With You that I taught to over 4,000 people. Um, I taught, it was a three-day seminar that I taught every learning module in it. And people ask me, well, how could you spend so much time doing that? Well, number one, you know, I, I I had people come in with the single biggest thing they were working on that could impact our company. And then when they walked out three days later, they had I helped them develop a plan to get that done because you can't get it done without developing people. So I love this. This was unbelievable. And I also love best practice visits. I used to go visit people and learn from them. So I decided that my mission going forward was to make the world a better place by developing better leaders. And we need more leaders. That's right. This is why you're doing this. But your 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 interviews here is to help people become better leaders, and that's why I'm I'm so delighted to be on this show. You know, if I can touch one person and help one person become a better leader, I've done it. So I developed the digital leadership programs. I I created this How Leaders Lead podcast, which, by the way, my podcast. I get more credit for doing that podcast than I ever did as a CEO of Yum. I mean, people say, God, I love that podcast you did with Lindra Nui or Jamie Dimon or Tom Brady or, you know, Andy Roddick or Steve Kerr, or, you know, you pick all these people, you know, yep. and they just love it. And, and I, I can't, I wasn't looking for that, but you know, every time anybody listens to one of my podcasts, they're going to pick up something that's going to help them become a better leader. And that's why it's becoming so, so popular. And, So, you know, I have David Novak leadership. I have some really high powered young people working with me every day, trying to, 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 you know, make the world a better place, developing better leaders. And, you know, it's it's fun. But uh, what I'm doing is spending time with what I love. So for me, it's leadership development. It's my family and it's golf. 
And if it's not one of those three things, I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it. Yeah. David, thank you so much. I feel like we could talk for hours and, um, you know, people clearly have a lot to learn from you and what you've done through uh, your CEO roles and in leadership. So thank you so much for being generous with your time and coming and sharing some of that with us. Jane, it was uh, it was my honor. I appreciate very much the opportunity, and I I love the your mission, and we share that mission. So it's it, it's it's great to be with you and Matt. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, great. Hit him straight. Okay, thanks. <laughs>